Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Joachim Yelicheyev from the University of Warsaw. Uh, so uh, before he starts his talk, I would like to say a few words about him. So Joachim obtained his PhD in 2017 at the University of Warsaw under the supervision of Jarosław Buczyński and Veronika Buczyńska. And quite recently, namely in April 2023, he received his habilitation. He is a winner of numerous prizes, including, for example, Prime Minister of Poland Prize for PhD, Scholarship for Outstanding Young Scientists, and also Kuratowski Prize. And uh, please, Joachim, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, whether this uh, Kuratowski Prize was awarded during the 100th anniversary of Polish Mathematical Society. So, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so, so I was there in Krakow, so, so I, I remember the event. Uh, okay, moreover, he's also uh, very active in the field of popularization, being a member of the problem committee, organizing local mathematical com problem committee for mathematical Olympiads, sorry. He also organizes local mathematical competitions and also uh, math uh, summer camps. And uh, okay, Joachim uh, will teach us uh, what what does it mean to, to classify? So I'm guessing that uh, his talk will be very much related to the very first talk of this workshop. Uh, so Joachim, please, the Zoom is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm sorry that it will be via Zoom, uh, but so it is. And indeed, it would be a bit related to the first talk, but at the same time, independent. So I will be more on the side of examples uh, rather than general theory, because somehow if you know, if you understand the most basic example well enough, then the general theory is just, you can extrapolate from that in the sense that you do not need to somehow work hard the general theory. If you already worked hard on the examples, then you can understand what sh what should the general theory be and then just check that it is as it is. Okay, so what does it mean to classify? And there will be definitely many, many answers to that. So the first answer is kind of on the combinatoric side. Uh, and of course it's, it can be very much non-trivial, but I would say that combinatorics can be thought of as finite sets here. So we want to classify some finite sets, uh, well, such as uh, permutations, maybe some sets with group actions, and then we just classify in the sense that if this is our set, then we say, okay, we classify, that's a dog. That's not perhaps, that's something exceptional in our list. Uh, and we have a bunch of bunnies. And if we look carefully enough, we can also see that those two are equal, even though maybe it's not, not so obvious. And that's the, the, that's the classification as a set. So you get a set and usually your set uh, is obtained by some equivalence relation. Such as those two being equal and that's it. There is nothing more. Okay, that is the level zero, but it is much more common in mathematics that you do not have a finite set. At least if you have a finite set, it's usually much more common to introduce some parameters as you have seen in the previous talk. Uh, and in particular, you could imagine that you have those uh, bunnies of varying sizes. So the size, will be some parameter here. And that's about everything you can say about on this situation. Okay, so the more, much more common situation is that, okay, forget about the dog because the dog was already somehow an outlier. Uh, you have continuous parameters. So, here I would imagine the size 
and you have things called colors. I'm not sure why, but for, for some reason in mathematics, a color is supposed to be discrete. Maybe this is just because uh, we used to have like 16 colors in the terminal. I'm not sure. Uh, so you have a bunch of discrete data and a bunch of continuous data and the classification should proceed by saying, okay, you have your object, you introduce this continuous invariant and maybe you also introduce this discrete invariant and then you can, uh, in the best situation, having this and this, you can recover your object. Fine. So let us try to see the most a basic example that all of you have seen and probably all of you have thought is trivial. Well, it is on some level trivial, namely the matrices over algebraically closed fields. So I will just be interested in n, n by n matrices over C. And then you know that you have the Jordan decomposition. So you say, okay, perhaps this matrix has some eigenvalues which may be not so easy to compute by hand, but definitely there are there. And then you have the shapes of Jordan cells, right? So if you have a matrix, maybe you can say that, okay, this matrix is similar uh, to a bunch of matrices where you have some eigenvalues, perhaps repeating ones, some other ones. And then you have some Jordan cell business. So for example, I can put ones here, I can put ones here, I can put zeros everywhere else. And that's it. And then from eigenvalues and from the uh, shapes of Jordan cells, you can build this matrix uniquely up to similarity. Okay, so the classification here will be that we have matrices modulo similarity relation. But then that's about everything which is taught on the linear algebra class. And well, usually the linear algebra doesn't go that much into how do you find the eigenvalues in a more sophisticated ways. So let us try to do this on the two by two upper triangular example. Upper triangular is just because I well, I want three parameters, not four, because it will be already a bit too much. So the general theory says that we have a matrix. Okay, maybe we want to compute the trace of this matrix. That's already some very nice invariant because it's easy to compute. It's a perfectly nice linear function. So then, okay, suppose we have a trace. So maybe we can take A and eliminate this part about the trace. So we substitute this, we get a matrix A prime, which is traceless. So I will just write like that with a slight abuse of notation. Okay, maybe a little less abuse of notation. And then Okay, we want to understand similarity here. So we had we have this all those matrices. We are interested in the set of matrices modular similarity. Fine. Then something a bit unexpected happens, maybe, because what you would expect is that you have C2, where you have two coordinate axis. And at least I would expect something nice if I divide the C2 by a similarity. But it, it's not really nice in any way because first of all, there are two cases. So if this is non-zero, then such an A prime is similar to a diagonal matrix, right? We know that matrices with different eigenvalues can be diagonalized. So this is similar to the diagonal matrix, which means that everything here 
gets contracted, right? So those, those red situation means that all those lines get contracted apart from this special zero value. So if, uh, if uh, this is zero, then we have two cases, right? Either the matrix itself is zero, and then it will be similar just to itself, or this one is not zero, and then this matrix is similar to um, the matrix with this Jordan block. And this means that if we divide by the similarity, I'm afraid that I need to erase something here. So I will erase that part, unless there are any questions so far. I guess not. I mean, probably so far you believe that this is a trivial example and it's true, it is a trivial example, but the whole point is that if you start thinking hard enough about a trivial example, you get something non-trivial usually. So if we do divide by this similarity action, then we get C without a zero. This is this part where this was not zero. Here we do get one point, and this point is where both of the things are zero, but actually we get a perfectly good point here. So if we divide by, by this relation, the result, if, if I denote this by x, if we denote this by x, then this is somehow bad. This is an, this x is uh, a topological space, but it's not Hausdorff even. So it's really bad. I mean, we would expect something like a nice matrix space, whatever, but it has those two points, which are, which cannot be separated by any open sets, right? The, the topology on X just comes from the map from C2, which, which was this division by the similarity. So we, we did the similarity thing and we get, we get something unexpected. And in particular, we do not get the situation that we would hope for in the sense that if we had those bunnies, then we had those two maps to the continuous parameters and discrete parameters, and we do not get them here. Namely, more precisely, what I claim is that if you try to make a map from the matrices to C, which sends a um, a matrix to its eigenvalue, any eigenvalue. If you try to form such a map, then F is not continuous. So it is not true that you can associate an eigenvalue to a matrix in a continuous way. Well, unless the matrices are just one by one matrices. Uh, and the example is as follows. You consider this matrices with indeed complex entries. This is rather important in the two by two case. So you fix this matrix, which is anti-diagonal. We compute its characteristic polynomial. And the whole point is that in the characteristic polynomial, you have this square of a complex number which means that the eigenvalues are, well, square roots, which you can interpret as lying in the unit circle. And uh, now, if you would like to have a map F, then this map should, should associate to M alpha, one of those two things, right? So if F exists, then f uh, of alpha or m of f of m alpha would be one of those. Or
Uh, and maybe to visualize this, uh, if you have alpha somewhere here, then one, one of those number, one of these numbers is lying here. The other one is lying here, which means that now, if we ask the function to be continuous, it means that if I vary alpha, I have to stay in this choice in the sense that when I start, so suppose I fix, suppose I fix the starting point and I fix it at one, which is the cosine of zero. Then this means that if I start going from zero up to alpha, then by continuity, I have to fix this value all the time. And now if I go with alpha to pi, right? So I started with zero, I go, I went somewhere. And then if I go to pi, then I mean, I'm still fixing this value. So at the very end, at time pi, I'm choosing cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. So at m pi, which is equal to m zero, I'm choosing the second eigenvalue, okay? Alpha goes from zero to pi, which means that my eigenvalue goes from one to the second eigenvalue, which is minus one. But at the same time, if I look at, try, I'm not sure I will be able to draw this, unfortunately, uh, in a nice way, at least. If I look at what m alpha does, then as alpha, goes from zero to pi here, on m alpha, I go twice the same speed. I go from m zero to m pi. Okay, so I land in the same point when I started, uh, whereas here I went from one eigenvalue to the second. So that, that proves that the function does not exist. And this thing is an example in topology of a two to one cover, which is non-trivial. So you can see that indeed the problem with this assumption is that we have some non-trivial covers. Okay, uh, since I cannot see this via Zoom, but I can probably guess that some of you think that this is boring, uh, maybe you should, we should pause for like 15 seconds and ask what would be the solution to this problem in the sense, that, okay, this function does not, is not continuous, which means that we do not have a nice map that associates from our Bunny matrix the its eigenvalue. We do not have this because this should be a nice map, so it should be continuous. So what could be the solution? That's a, not, not a rhetoric question, that's like a question for, for the audience but I, I will not wait that much, so don't worry. Joachim. Yeah? Is it taking a quotient? Taking the quotient of what? Of the both eigenvalues? It's taking the quotient of both eigenvalues. Well, the quotient is minus one, uh, but you are pretty close. It's not taking the quotient, right? Because the, while one of the eigenvalues is this, the other one is this. So the quotient mm -hmm. is minus one. But mm -hmm. indeed, you should take not the quotient, by the, but the product of eigenvalues. Ah, okay. And the, what's the product of eigenvalues? Well, that's, that's usually known as the determinant, at least here in our setup. And this is indeed the solution. So. As on linear algebra, you do not compute the eigenvalues directly usually. Well, depends, but very frequently you, you compute this polynomial, which I will denote in this stock high of A, which is the characteristic polynomial. And you could argue that computing this polynomial is computing the eigenvalues in the sense that, well, it contains all the eigenvalues with multiplicities. And it's only up to you whether you consider that having a polynomial is the same as having its roots, but at least it's the best we can hope for, right? So the 
the parameter is not the eigenvalue, but it's the tuple of, of all eigenvalues. And this tuple of all eigenvalues, uh, I identify with this polynomial, right? To have to have a, an ordered tuple of roots of a polynomial is the same as have a, have a, having a polynomial. Sorry, is it right to think that the problem is uh, due to the fact that uh, somehow the choice of this eigenvalue is uh, non-canonical? There is no canonical way to choose uh, a particular eigenvalue, yes? You, you yes. have a matrix, you have a bunch of eigenvalues and no, no eigenvalue is in any anyhow distinguished. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. This is this is this is what was here. This uh, swapping of the eigenvalues exactly tells us that none of the eigenvalues can be distinguished. If you had uh, some analytic functions, then you may think of this as having branches of the square root. There is mm -hmm. no possibility so, of taking the square root in a canonical way for. Yeah. So so this is a. Something like the the problem of uh, non-existence of a section of of some map. Yes, exactly. We mm -hmm. have a two to one cover, which is the two to one cover that is uh, taught every time. And this two to one cover is non-trivial, so it doesn't have a section. And this implies that there is no eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Great. So now. This map from A to high of A is a perfectly nice continuous map. It's just some polynomial. So we are happy with the continuous parameter. And we have still the discrete parameter as shapes of the Jordan cell, right? If, if we have, have uh, high, if we know this high of A, we can imagine that we compute the lambda i's. So we can have uh, up to similarity the Jordan cells. Great. Uh, so that's about what I can say here. Well, you could you could imagine that taking this polynomial is just taking the tuple of its coefficients. Uh, and that's not that important. What is important is that, that you can prove that this is optimal in the sense that whenever you have a function to any topological space, which is continuous and to which factors through the similarity relation, then this, fa then this function factors through high. Okay. So you cannot do better. Any function, whatever, will come from high. And I can quite convince you about this, hopefully, because if you think about the fiber of high, say, suppose, suppose we want to consider the fiber over, so suppose n is two, and we want to consider the fiber over such things. Well, then the fiber up to a similarity, always, uh, the fiber consists of either this matrix or this matrix. And you could imagine that the fiber is discrete, but it is not. Actually, the fiber contains this matrix for every T, which means that if you look at the fiber, you have this special value, but then you have any other value, and this this is similar to that one. Okay, so now if you have any continuous function to any x, as in the proposition, and you want to understand what this function does on this particular subset of matrices, well, then this function will be constant here. Because all those matrices are similar to a constant matrix. And because of continuity, it will be constant everywhere. Okay. Which, by the way, means that you cannot recover this shape of the Jordan cell in a continuous way. 
right? You cannot distinguish between this point and this point in a continuous way because one of them lies in the closure of the other one. Okay. And you may play around with trying to understand how the trace of a power of matrix A relates to all this because the trace is definitely, uh, well, definitely constant on similarity classes. And so it's a nice function. So it has to be somehow presented in this way. Okay, questions? Okay, if not, then let me stress that we have this, this leg, but we prove that there is no existence of this leg in the sense that there is no way to get the shape of the Jordan cell in a continuous way. That's somehow sad. I mean, you, you can take two approaches to that. Either it's good and just you just say, okay, the characteristic polynomial is great. I don't care about the shape of the Jordan cell or you want to preserve the shape of the Jordan cell for some reason. And then you say that it's sad that you do not have such a nice function. And if you think that that's sad, then you should add data uh, usually. And this data is called the framing data. So the idea is that we do not consider matrices alone, but we add something like salt to the recipe to be able to construct a better space. So in particular case, we consider tuples of matrix and a bunch of vectors. And then we require this key stability property, which means that there is no subspace. So no, let me just rephrase this, no proper subspace such that first of all, it is, it is preserved by A and second, it contains all those vectors, okay? In other words, that means that if you start with this set of vectors, if you apply A to those, if you apply A square and so on, then all these things have to span CN. Great, uh, there is no explanation so far why we did this, but at least maybe there is some explanation on one ha what happens. Uh, so if you start with one vector, then this means if this is stable, then this means exactly that this set of applications is linearly independent. And now there is a homework exercise that you may like to do that for A such V1, exists if and only if for all lambda eigenvalue of A, the eigenspace, the generalized eigenspace is uh, a single Jordan cell. Okay. If you've seen a, a modern proof of the Jordan uh, form, then you may see this immediately. If not, you can do some linear algebra to see this. And that means that for R equal one, we get only those matrices. We do not get all the matrices. But for R equal two, we, we do get some more matrices. For example, for R equal two, this, uh, this zero matrix with those two vectors, V1, V2, uh, this tuple is stable because there is no subspace containing the basis, which is not the whole space. So you get, so the, the bigger R grows, the 
more stable tuples you get. Great. And then we would like to know we would like to do the similarity thing once again, but now we need to decide what does similarity mean. And to decide this, formally speaking, we want to consider the action of invertible matrix. But okay, the action of this matrix on A will be this, but it turns out that we also want the action on vectors uh, just by multiplication. We want to do this because uh, in this way, we have that A V1 is, if we act on this by G, then this is the same as having this action on A time, this action here. Okay, so now we have this tuples, we have the action, and we may consider the stable tuples. Sorry, we may consider the stable tuples modulo this similarity, so modulo GLN. And this is something we all, so far we only know that it has a map to matrices modulo GLN. And then there is a theorem by Grothendieck, which is a very special case of a theorem by Grothendieck, and it was known before Grothendieck, but uh, I will in a second formulate the generalization. So I wanted to put Grothendieck here, and I also wanted to put this fancy symbol. Uh, so this, this is where we say that, okay, now we win in the sense that there is a Hausdorff topological space Q and R and a map F from the stable tuples to this space such that the fibers are GLN orbits. So there is nothing more in the fibers than just dividing by the group action. By introducing this additional stability data, we indeed obtained the possibility to divide by this action and to divide by obtaining a nice Hausdorff topological space. And for those of you who know about varieties, and this is an algebraic scheme, which can be interpreted as some algebraic or analytic, if you prefer variety with some singularities. Uh, and somehow by definition, there is a map uh, from this quotient to this quotient. So if, if I can identify this with CN, then this is this Q and R. So there is this, there is a map and this map is nice. It's a proper map, which means that the fibers are, uh, well, nice uh, compact varieties. Well, nice, sorry, nice compact topological spaces. And for R equal one, we do not get anything new. But you could imagine that for R equal two, we do get something new. Okay, so just to perhaps make the contrast between those two constructions, we had this chi from the matrices to CN to this polynomials, and we have them up from to quote so from stable tuples to this Q and R. Uh, and now here, indeed the fibers are orbits. Here, the fibers are closures of orbits. But also this map is a bit more explicit than this one. So there is this, kind of exchange uh, or trade-off that either you want a more explicit map, like you just want to have some map with given properties. So you, you build this bridge and you do not care that much about the inner uh, ecology of the system, or you really want a map that divides exactly by, by what you want. So you kind of want to preserve all the structure. So you want to preserve all the ecology, but then maybe you need to introduce some additional measures, right? So here, the map high, uh, it goes like source 
is the original space. Uh, and here, the source is the space plus some framing. Framing, coloring, there are different names for that, which means that adds some data. So here, the source is kind of more obscure than the original one, but the fibers are better, which means that the equivalence classes you get here are closer to the original problem. Okay, if you ever uh, read about geometric invariant theory, then you should remember this as, a, as an example of a variation of geometric invariant theory, uh, probably the simplest one. Uh, and again, once more, you have a map here, which comes from high. So somehow this course uh, problem, is, well, this course construction is a special case of this more general one. Okay, any questions? Okay, if not, then let me proceed about the idea of the construction. And the construction of the code will be already something beyond linear algebra, uh, or maybe linear algebra depends on how you had, how was your proof about the existence of the Jordan form. One of the proof, uh, one of the proofs which is given usually on the algebra classes is that you consider your matrix as a variable in a polynomial ring and you act and you make this uh, action by the matrix using the notion of the module, right? So you, you say that your vector space becomes a module over this polynomial ring, uh, which means that you have a multiplication like that. And this is just defined by, the multi by saying that the multiplication by X is the application of the matrix to your vector. And then the stability condition may be more naturally summarized by saying that if you take a map that starts with all those vectors and applies arbitrary polynomials in A to those vectors, then this map is surjective, right? That, that was the definition of the stability condition, but now it's phrased more abstractly. And since this map is surjective, it's almost determined by its kernel. And indeed, the point of this quote scheme corresponding to this tuple is the kernel of pi. So I have a quick question. So, so the, yeah, the, thanks. the matrix uh, uh, can be viewed as an uh, element in a polynomial ring. So, so you mean a characteristic polynomial, yes, of this matrix? Or? Uh, no, 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 the matrix is not viewed as, a, as an element of the polynomial ring. It is rather that we have M. M admits an action of the matrix. But yeah. from the abstract perspective, it's better to say that M admits an action of this polynomial ring. So there is this multiplication in, in the polynomial ring where X acts as a matrix. Uh, okay, okay. So, so the on the- Matrix is fixed, A, A is fixed once and for all, and you, uh, okay, you-, you Right, A, 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 A is- A free variable, okay. Yeah, and I consider A as a free variable. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. And I just do this to- uh, ha to use the language of modules. So on the on the theoretical level, we change language, but nothing happens really. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we get this kernel, and then we get uh, this thing is isomorphic to M now as as a module, which means that we can recover the matrix A from this thing by saying that we take the matrix of multiplication of X. Remember, we want two matrices up to similarity, so we actually can fix a basis, and fixing a basis of this uh, turns it into M, okay? So from this kind of arcane object, we can recover uh, A by multiplication, and we can also recover V1 up to VR because VI is just the class of the generator with one on I coordinate. Okay. 
And now going back a bit to what uh, Tomek was saying on Monday, uh, such subspaces can be parameterized by a Grassmannian. So actually this construction says that our quote is a closed subset of the Grassmannian. So I will not elaborate on that here, but it is that we begin with the Grassmannian and then we get quote as a subspace. Fine. Uh, so maybe let me just go back to the case R equal one. So remember R is the number of those vectors such that we have a stable tuple, which means that this is the number of vectors which have to lie in our subspace. Uh, and for R equal one, the stability says that for R equal one, there is only one possibility of having stability, which means that these particular vectors have to be linearly dependent. If you want, this is, a, this is completely formal. So we can, you can think this over. Uh, and then the map is rather boring because the kernel is exactly the characteristic polynomial. So in the case R equal one, we do get what was previously. Mm, there, is, there is nothing happening, but what's interesting is the case R greater than one. And I have just one example, which I'm not sure if it is enlightening, but maybe it would be. So there is matrix, we have two vectors. Uh, well, okay. So first of all, we see that if we apply the first, the first vector, then we get, oops, okay. Then we see a typo, first of all. Uh, if we apply this vector, then we get this, which means that, I'm sorry, but this should be the other way around to be stable. Okay, so up to this change, we have that this vector, this vector, and this vector form a basis. So indeed, the tuple A V1, V2 is stable in the sense that if we begin from V1, V2, if we apply A, then we get everything. And apart from that, nothing interesting happens in the sense that the application of those two things just yields zero, which means that the kernel is okay. The kernel is given by, well, the kernel lies in C of X plus C of X, where this first coordinate is corresponding to V1, the second to V2. So this condition translates into the condition that the kernel contains zero X. The first, this condition translates into the condition that the kernel contains X square zero, and that's enough. So it's actually isomorphic. So our point of quote is, uh, this special subspace. Okay, likely it's hard to follow this example in real time, but if you have questions, feel free to ask or feel, or feel free to ask afterwards. Good. Uh, and maybe I will just make a very tiny remark on why this is interesting. Uh, the point is that if you start with a matrix, in, in here, th this is a rather nice matrix because here, if I take this A and I, if I take this, then A, V is stable. Uh, then you can associate to this matrix the module and you can even think about this module as somehow geometrically parameterizing what happens if you cut with T, uh, if you cut the parabola with T. And what I sneaked here is that 
all this construction works with parameters. I have a parameter T here, uh, and I have a parameter T here, but it changes nothing with respect to stability. Great, and as the last part for the purely linear algebra thing, I should advertise that this is not easy uh, in the sense that there are open problems in this setup. And one of the most famous ones is, and also the elementary one, is the Gersten-Haber problem, which says that if you fix triples of matrices, and if you consider the algebra generated by them, which means that you take all those matrices, you multiply them in all possible ways and in all possible lengths, then for some reason, it, this algebra has to have dimension at most n. Okay, so it's called by, it's called Gersten-Haber problem because Gersten-Haber uh, did the case n equal to, sorry, did, did the case uh, x, y, so pairs. Uh, so the answer for pairs uh, is yes. For pairs, such things is always, uh, always holds. For triples, it's open. Actually, Gersten Haber argument uh, was that first of all, if X and Y are diagonalizable, then the answer is yes. And this, you can always see that if the matrices are diagonalizable, then the answer is yes. And then the second key ingredient was saying that the appropriate quad uh, is irreducible. So actually what he says is that in appropriate quad, the set of tuples with those two things diagonalizable is dense. And somehow using the, uh, using the densedness, you can say, okay, the fact that this space has, has dimension at most n is closed. It holds for diagonalizable matrices. Diagonalizable matrices are dense, so it holds all the time. So the, the fact uh, that this quad has this dense subset was key. And this fact is known to be false for triples. This is why the problem is open for triples. Sorry, I have a question. So, as you mentioned, this problem is open for triples, but uh, is there any particular example of n where it is solved for triples? N being yeah. the size of uh, n. Yeah, so the answer is uh, yes uh, for n at, at most 11. Uh, and the answer is exactly because uh, then quote is, irredu is irreducible. So, because two holds. So this thing, if I go from pairs to triples, then it will not hold in general, but for up to 11, it does hold. So and for, for larger and it is not known or is it- It is not known. Not true, not known. No, 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 the, I mean, the, uh, sorry. Wait, it depends on what is this. Uh, for larger n, 2 is not true. For, not true, okay. For n, I guess 2 is not true. And the, by the way, this is another open question. Uh, what's, what happens in between 11 and 29? So there is an, an explicit example for 29 that says, that is a triple of uh, matrices which cannot be in the closure of the set of diagonalizable ones, uh, but it's not clear what happens in between. I'm sorry, is there any deep reason why those numbers pop up, 11 and 29? No, there is no reason and there is no, I, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's hard to say what's the underlying reason. Mm. Uh, it's also not so clear whether those numbers will turn out to be 
the uh, well the exact numbers were two is not true i mean i would definitely believe that from from 11 you can go up but this is just hard uh, well very hard research level math uh, to do this case because you have to somehow be able to understand triples of commuting matrices Exactly. And this, there, there is no parameterization or anything. Yeah, so it's interesting that you can play around with this and people do some experiments because you can just plug in random values or plug in your favorite values and see what comes out of this. Uh, and it seems to be true, but it's not clear why. Perhaps the most interesting thing is not even the answer true but the explanation would have to reveal something a bit deeper uh, um, about the space of pairwise commuting matrices okay and there is an op another open question that i think i will skip for the purposes of the time um, what i would like to at least mention is that i was talking about a single matrix and then i started talking about triples of matrices and I didn't, I, I was not caught on that, uh, but now I want to up, kind of explain this anyway. So the real power of this stability uh, comes from the fact that you can consider any number of matrices and for technical reasons, you want them to be commuting. Uh, and, and if you do this, you get exactly the same thing, which is very far from linear algebra now. So you consider tuples of commuting matrices, you consider the vectors which make those tuples stable. And then there is this Hausdorff topological space and a map from the stable tuples to this space such that the fibers are GLN orbits where the GLN acts as you would expect, it acts by conjugating all the matrices and multiplying uh, usually in all the vectors. So that's indeed a theorem of Grothendieck proper uh, that such a space exists. And there are like tons of open problems about this space coming, starting from uh, M equal to two. So already starting from two matrices, there are yeah, there are very, very funny open problems, both computational and theoretical. And starting from three matrices, it's already very hard. Uh, we know that starting from four matrices, everything goes south, everything becomes untrue, like uh, all the intuitions become untrue. For three matrices, we do not know. For two matrices, we know that a lot of things are, that a lot of things are true, but not everything. Okay, and maybe if whenever you have such an abstract construction, it would be a nice reality check to put the naive values and see what happens. So let us try to do M equal to zero, which means no matrices at all. So for M equal to zero, the stability notion is that you consider tuples of vectors and now they have to span CN right because the, st the stability condition no longer has any matrices so the stability condition just says that uh, they they do span cn so in particular this holds uh, and then there should be a nice topological space that parameterizes those vectors uh, up to GLN action, and this is the Grassmannian. So as a special case of this quad thing, for the empty set, you get you get the Grassmannian. You get it a bit in an inverted way in the sense that the fact that those vectors span CN means that there is a natural map that sends EI to this vector is surjective, and this natural map has a kernel. And having pi is essentially the same thing as having the kernel. 
So, and the kernel has dimension uh, R minus N. Yeah, sorry, it should be, uh, it should be R minus N here, not N minus R. So the Grassmannian is, is obtained uh, and the subspace in the Grassmannian corresponds to the surjection. Good. So that would be uh, the m equal to zero. The higher m actually did not use this language of uh, matrices, although it's possible, but it's much more useful to go to this module language in the sense that we had previously, we had all these surjections. And now we have the same thing, but we work over a polynomial ring in many variables. And then the points are indeed surjections uh, onto something which is a module, but is also an n-dimensional vector space. And yeah, mm, I guess for the purposes of the time again, I'm sorry, but I will skip the examples mm, because I believe I have something like three minutes. Uh, so I would rather emphasize that for this space, we do not know much about the topology and about the geometry. Uh, and those are already kind of higher level questions that you can ask, most of them rather tricky. Uh, and yet, it is possible to say something for this space. Uh, and the possibility of this is exactly by the language of functors. So we are thinking about, formally speaking, we are thinking about the quad functor. And the idea is as follows. We know that we have a space that, okay, we don't know, but we would like to have a space such that the points are such surjections then we would like to figure out what should be the maps from C to our space. And it turns out that there is a canonical way to do this. You just have surjections with a parameter. So introducing the parameter means that you have a surjection from ring with this new parameter T. And also the surjection is no longer on a vector space, but it is rather on a free module over this parameter ring, right? So it's this thing is of this form. And if you think a little more about this, so if you rem remember that this was this, then introducing this parameter can be introduced here. So over any ring, we can form this tensor product ring and a family over A is by definition a surjection from here where M is, we would like to say a free A module. It turns out that we have to be a little bit careful and say locally free, whatever that means. It's a slightly weaker notion than being free, but it's much, much better behaved. Mm. So the outcome of this is that we would like to understand this quad business and to understand this, rather than constructing the space directly, we first construct the factor and then construct the space that parameterizes this factor. Okay, so that would, that would be one, the final observation that about the quote, rephrasing what I just said. We start with a set and then if the set is nice in any case, that means that maybe the set is just of the form F of point where F is some factor to sets from some category. For example, if we know that our nice set is a topological space, to know this is the same as saying that X 
is of this form for C equal to the topological space. If we know that X is a manifold, uh, we can consider C to be the category of manifolds. So whenever you have some nice set, you can try to re rephrase this as the functor from some category. Of course, it doesn't, I mean, the quad, the quad scheme here is just an example, maybe not the easiest example to handle, but at least an example in which you can see how everything works. I guess, yeah, I guess I will stop here. I can adver advertise that I have one more slide on stack and one more slide on infinity category. So if you have, if you want even more abstraction, you can ask questions uh, and otherwise, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. So let me see whether there are any questions. Maybe we'll start with our on-site audience. Okay, so let uh, maybe let me ask, uh, I would like to, you to show these two additional slides about uh, infinity categories and, and stacks. Yeah, okay, so this, yeah, uh, I guess the audience was a bit scared. Uh, okay, so the stacks come from not adding this additional vector. So remember, we had, we had the matrix and then we added those vectors and introduced the, stab the stable tuples and in this setup, we had a nice uh, map, which divided by the GL action, which divided by the, well, by the similarity action. Uh, and that would not hold for matrices themselves, uh, as I explained, and maybe I will try to explain this once more here, uh, the point is that if you consider such family of matrices parameterized by T, then for every T this, you get the same matrix up to similarity, but for T equals zero, you get a different matrix, right? So you, you, you would, if you had a nice map somewhere, which would factor through the similarity, then this map will have to send this matrix to the same matrix as here just because of continuity. And that would violate the fact that the fibers should be just similarity classes. And from the stacky perspective, the problem is that we are expecting a set of isomorphism classes. And in fact, what we should expect is rather a groupoid. So in the stacky language that I think will appear uh, later this week and which is much more abstract, we say that n-dimensional vector spaces form a stack and this stack has a map from a point because there is exactly one m-dimensional space with a chosen basis, which is just c to the n. So there is a map from point to vect. And it turns out that this map is smooth and it has n-dimensional fibers, whatever this means. So you have a map from point to vect and somehow inside the point, you can fill n-dimensional uh, fibers. Uh, and this, this has dimension minus n. So that, that shows that you can do stacks, but indeed the geometry gets more complicated, a lot more complicated because so notions like dimensions start behaving in a not expected way. That's sometimes good, that sometimes is very bad. And a stack can be interpreted as a factor to groupoids. Groupoids are topological spaces and this infinity category stuff can be more or less interpreted as functors to topological spaces. And they come with a ton of structure. They are very interesting. They are sometimes useful, but you should always, before you start learning infinity categories, you should always kind of ask what's the trade-off? What would you get from learning all this uh, abstract machinery? And in particular, 
what are the important examples? That's always a good question to ask when you start considering learning such advanced stuff. Okay, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions from outside audience? Okay, let me see whether there is something on the zone. We don't see any raised hands. Okay, so maybe uh, let me ask one more question. So I heard that uh, in this uh, higher category theory, when you go uh, from one categories to higher categories, uh, there is no unique approach. But uh, I would like to ask whether it is uh, the case in the context of infinity categories, that there is only one sensible approach or, or even there, there are ambiguities. What is your perspective I mean, on this problem? There are a, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, there are not there are no ambigu ambiguities in the sense that those approaches tend to be equivalent. Okay, so the I mean the the infinity categories have only one problem, essentially that they have infinite infinite number of axioms, so. If you are to check this infinite number of axioms, it's a bit hard to work with axioms directly. So there are models for those infinity categories. And one of the dominant one is the one by Lurie uh, on simplicial sets. I guess simplicial sets will also appear. Uh, so simplicial sets are kind of easier than topology here. Uh, and well, it's dominant because Lurie wrote like two books, like Higher Topos Theory and Higher Algebra, which are very concrete and at the same time a bit readable at least. So this just means that a lot of people are learning these approaches. And now I guess uh, Lurie wants to do this Kerodon thing, which is somehow trying to build a uniform uh, basis for this infinity category thing uh, without simplicial sets even. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one can say a lot uh, about what happens there, maybe the important thing somehow to note is that indeed this is a work uh, in the on the basic level of infinity categories. The infinity categories work nicer than stacks in many ways, but it's also much much more harder to work with infinity categories. Like everything has to be constructive. You do not you it's quite impossible to get a pro to give a proof which is not constructive which uses some action of choice because if you choose something where whenever you will have so many problems down the line uh, that it is not possible because somehow to get this infinity factor you need to have this one factor you need to have the two factor you need to have the three factor and so on and if you choose anything here, then you will start getting problems somewhere on level seven, uh, where <laughs> the notation is so heavy that it's virtually impossible to understand how to solve the problem. So everything, everything in this approach is very much constructive. And that's, that means that there are different approaches, different uh, formalisms, because if you want to be constructive and not work on the axiomatic level, then there are different formalisms. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, so let us thank our, our speaker again. Okay, and I will stop recording. Mm -hmm.